there's some behaviors that you wouldn't necessarily think about like certain uh little something like checkerboard cichlids they cool. will quite, they will quite happily kind of pick up bits of leaves and stuff and check under them for stuff and you wouldn't see that normally and kind of i i i've, I've got a lot of love for kind of a cluttered substrate um most people just seem to go like bare sand bed or something like that i, I quite like having a mix of some seed pods here or there some leaves and then what i don't see enough of from people is just sticks twigs mm. different sizes people seem to limit botanicals to seed pods and leaves I just forget about sticks and one thing I've noticed in Peru especially a lot of the time you put the net on the floor drag it up it's half of it's full of leaves um loads of these kind of uh like sand dwelling whiptail species they're all sitting amongst a load of leaves and then or loads of twigs that kind of stuff and then when I'm feeding some of my wood cats and stuff, if you've got lots of clutter, it makes feeding time more enriching because they have it's not just all oh, the the foods on top of the sand. They're having to kind of snuffle between everything, mm-hmm. other things, push twigs out of the way to get to stuff, and it just creates a much more interactive environment um, that is better for them mentally because it's stimulating them creating a more interactive kind of actual three-dimensional environment for them to be a part of because and this is going to sound a bit philosophical and fancy but ultimately we've put them in a glass box it's our kind of duty to enrich their lives as much as possible in Mm -hmm. that box Mm -hmm. if you've just got bare sand of a piece of wood there's only so much that fish can do yeah whereas if you've got tons of clutter tons of stuff going on whilst creating all of the niches that fish might potentially want to utilize either in the wild or in the tank you'll get to see a lot more going on um and one thing that you definitely I think people overlook a lot is stereotyping behaviors. Are you aware of what that is? Or I am aware of what a stereotype is, but not when it comes to yeah. I guess you can kind of make the logic when it comes to fish, but yeah, continue with what you're so stereotyping behaviors are you see it most of the time in stuff like big cats at the zoo. They've kind of you can see where that big cat has been pacing. It's got a truck pacing into the floor. Or there's some quite famous videos of like polar bears basically standing still, just kind of waving their head in a certain pattern. And it's when their habitat isn't enriched enough, whether that's through tank size or whether that's through enclosure size or stuff filling tanks to pass the time and to keep their brains occupied they start undertaking these kind of these stereotyping behaviors where they're kind of doing the same pattern over and over again you see it in some people's dogs if they don't take it out for a walk enough they'll like lay a track around the garden or something um and people don't realize that that happens in fish as well. So one issue I've been having a little bit with my Tatia orcas, um, which are up in that above the tank that looks like it's the sun, um, right up there is um, one or two individuals, no, just one individual in there has been showing this stereotyping behavior. I believe that's because with Tatiroka 
there's a bit of variation with wood cats. Some of them are just quite sedentary, don't move a lot. Others are almost just straight pelagic. As soon as they come out of hiding, they are just swimming non-stop. And so put that in the confines of walls and they start having to find certain swim routes to be able to fulfill that need to move. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's where you see things like glass surfing. Now, glass surfing occasionally, that's fine. Glass surfing in any fish where you start to see the same repeating pattern over and over again. Now, it might not be doing it all the time, but it's like maybe each evening you'll just notice, oh, hang on, that fish has done kind of that same loop and it's just done it four times in a row. Oh, then it's been distracted by food, but then it's gone back and done that loop a few more times. And certain species seem to be more prone to it than others. I know it's a big one in stuff like uh, Amazon puffers. Um, and well, puffer fish in general seem to be quite prone to it. There's some lots of videos of puffer fish in public aquariums going up and down the same piece of wall. And the other thing, the other kind of heartbreaking thing about it is once a stereotypy behavior is ingrained, even if the habitat changes completely, the animal might still carry on exhibiting that behavior. There's been instances of tigers that were kept in captivity that were that, that were exhibiting stereotyping behaviors in captivity that were then released back into the wild. And even though they're in the wild, no walls, because that stereotyping behavior was so ingrained, they still had the, that their daily track where even though they've been put in this new location in the wild, in their territory, they've still created this daily track. Mm -hmm. And so glass surfing is definitely, I'm going to say the fish equivalent, if it's the same repetitive pattern. And I've noticed it in one with one of my orcas. And unfortunately, even though I have changed things quite a lot, bigger tank, different layouts, that one orca, for whatever reason, is still showing that kind of, it'll do a couple loops in the top left corner of the tank and then do a lap of the tank, come back, do another loop of that corner of the tank. And um, yeah, um, I've just realized quite how far off topic I've gotten. I can't. No, 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 stay on this. This is incredibly fascinating. Um, I totally thought what you were talking about earlier was a completely different thing and you're blowing my mind and I'm enjoying this. Please continue on as much as you want. Um, so, yeah, stereotyping behaviors and making sure that you are essentially enriching the animals in your care's lives enough is way more important than people realize because it can have lasting psychological damage on the animals that you're caring for. Mm. Um, now, the difficulty is some species are yeah, more prone to it than others. And it's potentially something that even when they were kept in the fish shop, if they were kept there for long enough in quite a bare tank, certain animals might have kind of picked it up then. And then they're stuck with that for the rest of their life. Um, and I mean, the orcas, I, I, that one orca, I've got no idea at what point it, it picked that up. It might have been when I had it in a slightly smaller tank in quarantine, because um, I ended up quarantining for a bit longer than I was intending on because I had to move between kind of home and uni and stuff. Um, but yeah, I've, I've done as much as I can to try and fix that. And none of the others have exhibited it. It's just this one individual. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's another fascinating topic that does not get touched on. I I, I just don't see it. 
So I've got a gazillion questions for you right now. Okay. Right. Uh, first first of all, we'll just, we'll just run through some of the uh, one or two of the comments we've had. Cool. Um, Rebecca has said that glass surfing, she thinks, sometimes is stereotypic and can be caused by just by stress, which kind of makes sense. I'm thinking just recently I've moved a whole bunch of my quarries from one tank to one together, and I'm seeing a lot of them doing that, and I'm wondering if that is just a stress behavior, and then they'll kind of calm down after a week or so, um, um, hopefully. Um, I mean, short-term glass surfing as a response to stress definitely makes sense. It's it's an invisible barrier yep. at the side of the tank, um, at, well, at the edge of their usable space. They're going to be, especially in a stress state, they often just want to swim, try to find somewhere that's safe. And so they'll be testing the limits of their environment, see what's available. Um, so yeah short-term glass surfing as a stress response i can definitely see how that's kind of um quite likely actually with with mm. most of it. um but then it's whether that becomes long term and they develop almost a routine with it that's when yeah. you're starting to look at it maybe being an issue yeah. and your best bet is that to then completely well, to either try and diagnose why, just whether there's not enough going on in the habitat, if it's not big enough, if it's, yeah. Um, yeah, just trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, so for me, with that situation, they're temporary in a tank, but they were going to permanently be in a tank of a similar size, um, trying to downsize, compress a whole bunch of tanks into one, but it's already made me question maybe that is not the right option uh, especially if they don't come down after another week or so, then that might not be the right option. Amount of fish, size available to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you've definitely made me rethink what I thought was probably going to be an acceptable solution might actually not be an acceptable solution. So I'm personally glad we're having this conversation right now. I mean, with uh, Corries, it is. Um it's interesting because glass surfing in quarries can sometimes be looking at suitable spawning sites some quarries spawn on glass sometimes that's just kind of observed like them just testing their environment oh this could be a nice kind of this might be a nice have we lost tim or have i lost him uh no i think um He's went quiet and he's frozen now. So he is. cool. Yeah. We we can pretend we know what we're talking about when it comes to this topic. Yeah, um, so talking about repetitive behaviours. I remember I had a, a rope fish, you know, the ones with the orange bellies. And oh, yeah. it came out and it sat at the front of the tank and just wait for something to come along. Cool. I, I think know. I'm back. Yep, you're back. We're good. Okay, cool. Um yeah, with uh Rob McClaw's episode a few weeks back, um, mm -hmm. fascinating, um, especially hearing about kind of quarries being more likely to spawn in smaller tanks, mm. um, basically just increased interaction with each other as a potential theory behind that. Um, and th th I've, I've definitely seen, I, I don't think I've seen Granted, I've not personally worked with that many Corydoradinae, but I've, I've seen plenty of Corys in kind of smaller tanks that haven't been displaying stereotypy. I've not personally seen stereotyping Corys before, um, but I don't have the experience with it enough to say. Uh, but with yours, I'm going to say likely it is. It was unless that they are showing because I feel like stereotyping probably is quite rare, but it's being able to recognize when it has happened. And it's yeah. not just glass surfing one off. It's uh, almost like clockwork. That Oh, that fish is doing that loop again. Mm. 
Uh, so chances are you're probably fine. <laughs> yeah. It's rare instances when, yeah, there's a bit more going on. Yeah. Um, so Renee has asked, is glass, surf is glass surfing a cause for concern? I mean, similar like we've been touching on. If it's just a one-off, if it's always different, probably not. It could just be them exploring their environment or testing the limits of their environment. But if it is, yeah, like I was saying, if it is habitual, almost the same every time, then you're starting to think something neurological is going on. Something has become so ingrained that that fish just feels like it has to do that all the time. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah. She's got a, a follow-up question. Oh, I've heard glass have mentioned quite a bit on social media, but there's no literature that they can find on that topic. Do you know of any literature on that? It's topic? very sparse. Um, stereotyping zucosis is studied a lot in, I'm going to say, the obvious animals, like big cats, uh, ursids, so bears, and some of these kind of bigger animals that show way more obvious symptoms and seem to be almost, seem to be like almost every case of them in captivity seems to show it to some extent. Um, it's way more studied than that. Annoyingly, you really don't see a lot of literature at all on the fish side, because most of the money in the fish world is in aquaculture. And yeah. unless yeah. it has something to do with food fish, you, you're not gonna get a lot of funding. Um, so th there's, I've I've done searches for it before, I've, I've just not managed to find a lot, but we can, I really wish that there was, so that we'd know more about it, but at the moment it's, it's very much like what we're observing fits the standard definitions for stereotypy. There's just not been much actual study mm -hmm. gone into it. Yeah. So, Brand, Brand and AKA, they said, my coolies do this loop from the bottom to the top on the side of my big tank every night for quite some time. Two of them do it in tandem. Would it be a common thing for two to do that or is it more of an individual thing? Um, I'm not sure. With, with social animals that do follow each other and mimic each other's behaviors sometimes, it's a possibility. Um, I have seen like one one of my orcas following the stereotype yorker before and i got quite concerned because i thought two of them were doing it but then that one stopped so i don't know if there's some kind of mimicry aspect with more social animals um but from the sounds of it if it's like almost every night they're doing that same loop that does sound like it's starting to get towards kind of a potential stereotype is kind of behavior cool um so back to where my brain is ticking over with we've talked you know, you've mentioned enrichment trying to break this sort of thing i went straight to big fish like arowana for example when they just because all they can do basically is loops of aquariums yeah because they have no other option yeah do you then think it is ethical to keep big ass fish they get way too big in aquariums because i would personally think that arowana should not be in aquariums because realistically personally most people can't can't house them i don't believe properly yeah so i mean i i i pretty much agree with that it's most of these big fish are not being provided with enough so many People, I, I've seen the excuse quite a few times of, um, oh, you have to keep it in the bear tank because otherwise it injures itself on the decoration and stuff. And I've seen that that ex kind of excuse 
and reasoning used quite a few times and it's it kind of baffles me because it's well, they're only injuring themselves on it because it's such a small environment realistically mm -hmm. for the size of the fish that it is and when you look at something like an arowana especially that is a fish that has a specialized morphology specifically designed to jump out of the water to catch things either on branches or in midair. Its whole physiology is built around being able to coil mm. up into it and launch itself out of the water. Um, and well, the added thing with, so with fish jumping, this is just a bit of a side tangent, fish jumping can be used as a cognition measurement. So fish like a hatchet fish, um there's a couple of little marble hatchets in there um mm -hmm. they use jumping as a predator evasion strategy yeah. there isn't a lot of thought that goes into that jump it is just oh shit, there's a, there's something there bang and they just launch themselves out of the water they don't think about it more than just getting out there right. whereas yeah. something that jumps for predation tactic there's a lot more thought that goes into that because they've got to a know where the prey is, b take into account the refraction of the water, c then figure out the distance they need to travel, so they don't put in too much or too little and miss completely. Um, so it can be used as a bit of a cognition measure. As generally, the more intelligent fish species are those that are jumping predators. Um, Archerfish taking that one up with then having to control jets of water and whatnot, as well as mm -hmm. um, so something like an arowana. Um, all of those people that say, Oh, just put a kind of a brick on the lid so it can't jump out, and then oh, look, it's jumped, hit the lid, and broken its spine or suffered head trauma because it's done the thing that it's biologically designed to do you've just got so much kind of such a misunderstanding of that animal that you're trying to deny it the one thing like the main thing that it's designed to do so mm. yeah i very much agree with you that like arowana is that they should not be kept in the general way that most people keep them i think the only ethical way of doing it would be well, A, I'm going to say a tank at least, got to be at least like 20 times the length of the fish in length yeah. and maybe yeah. 10 times in width, mm -hmm. um, something like that. And then having the facilities around that to allow for jumping. So whether that's like kind of some kind of, a bit of a crude comparison but almost like a suicide net like yep. something around so that if it does jump and go out the side it's not going to fall on the floor it needs a safe way of jumping so that it always ends up back in the tank mm -hmm. and it needs big enough space outside of the tank so that it can jump to its full extent and needs to be fed appropriately as well so mm -hmm. that it exercises those muscles um kind of and showing the behaviors well, back, back to natural behaviors again showing these naturalist behaviors that it's meant to um and there's so many people that just seem to want to shove a big fish in a big ish tank because it looks cool and there's no thought gone into its its behaviors and what it's what that fish is designed to do essentially 